All right, so shall we start? Uh, yes, uh, uh, I have a few announcements and uh, I will uh, very quickly uh, announce it and then we go to the today's session. Yeah. And uh, since the session is recorded, so we just start at the right time. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Uh, welcome to Topology Optimization Webinar. Uh, my name is Jun Wu, I'm speaking from Delft. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with this webinar, uh, so this webinar is uh, endorsed by ISMO, the International Society for Structural and Multidisciplinary Optimization. The idea was initiated by colleagues from DTU Denmark and TU Delft. Today is the fifth session, and over the past uh, four uh, months, we have speakers and organizers from around the world representing the diversity of topology optimization research. Um, we are happy to have Professor uh, Chen Li to chair today's session. Uh, it's very difficult to organize such a session at the beginning of a new semester. Uh, many colleagues have ditched until this, uh, so we have to adapt ourselves to this COVID situation. Uh, Professor Li made uh, great efforts to organize this session. Thank you. Um, a few announcements. So this is the fifth session. We are still experimenting what is the best format for this online event. Uh, from the feedback we have received, uh, we plan to do a few adjustments in the following sessions. The first adjustment is from this session, we don't distinguish keynote speakers. So that means each speaker has the same amount of time. That is 15 minutes. That is longer than previously 10 minutes. Uh, we hope this will help to explain the ideas without going too much to the mathematical details. Uh, a second a change, which is a rather big change, is uh, from next session, we would uh, uh, experiment semantic sessions. That is a session dedicated to a particular topic. Um, the first such a session is about large scale and efficient topology optimization organized by Niels Arger from DTU Denmark. Uh, the idea to have a semantic session is to, on the one hand, introduce uh, the basics of a particular topic to allow people who are less familiar with that topic to learn something new and to, at the same time to allow in-depth discussion on that particular topic, even among speakers. Uh, so we would uh, alternate in between semantic sessions and regular sessions. A regular session is a session uh, without a particular topic. Um, the topics we have in our mind currently are uh, large scale optimization, um, data-driven approach, multi-physics, uh, that is structure, and of course, design for manufacturing, et cetera. Um, uh, another thing is, uh, you may have noticed on the website, we have slides from previous sessions already partially online, so uh, it helped us to learn uh, that particular paper. And with this, uh, I would like to turn to Professor Lee. Please join me to welcome Professor Lee to host today's session. Thank you very much, Jun. And uh, uh, yeah, welcome to our fifth uh, top webinar. And uh, um, today we have uh, four speakers. Uh, the initial uh, program include one more professor from Japan. Unfortunately, he cannot make it today. So hopefully he can actually present in one of the future sessions. Uh, yeah, so the webinar, as June just mentioned, promotes and encourages the geographic diversity. So I'm very really proud to be the first host from South Hemisphere. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I would like to take this opportunity to greatly appreciate the organizers in the Netherlands, June, and in the Denmark, Nelson and Orle. They put a great effort to make this happen. So that allows us to get it together in a basically minus space. Uh, as I mentioned today, we have four speakers. Uh, so I don't want to spend time to introduce each of those. And uh, um, let's start from the first speaker, Professor Michael Wan from Hong Kong University of Science Technology. Um, I stopped sharing my screen and the mic can bring yours. All right, let me fire up my screen. I hope you are able to see my screen and I'm delighted uh, to share with you a piece of our uh, recent work 
It's uh, uh, again on level set, but this time it's a uh, uh, cellular level set in these lines. And uh, the work is drawn from a uh, uh, number of uh, publications very recently uh, with some of my former students and, uh, and their students. I will show their photos uh, in the very end. So we're all familiar with the level set. It's a global level set function, describe a geometric boundary of the structure that you optimize. And that typically is the inside dissonant function and you might have a parametric representation. And then you have to go through sensitivity analysis, figure out the uh, hematology coding equation and dealing with some of the pneumatic, uh, pneumatic issues. Uh, so what we thought was that what if you not use global level set function, but rather cut your design domain into pieces, subdomains or cells, and on each subdomain or cell, you define independent level set function. Then you can change the level set function over all cells, and you should be able to achieve same effects to do topology alteration. Of course, there should be some other benefits. So here, uh, if you have a cellular structure you are designing, you have cells predefined, and on each cell you could have a fully independent level set function to control, to optimize that particular cell. So with cellular level set functions. Now, it would be able to do what we normally be able to do with global level set function, but more, uh, we will have more flexibility. We'll be able to control at cell levels. We'll be also distribute constraints, for example, mass distributions, sti stiffness distributions over cells. And we could have more distributed uh, environment to help us to do parallel uh, computing for large scale computing. And furthermore, in B splines, and you may be able to make use of the B spline properties to do some of uh, geometric modeling, which I will show you very quickly. So instead of getting all the details, I will just show you fundamental concepts, couple of issues, and then we'll get to the uh, some of the results. So once you cut the level set function into pieces over different cells, one of the major issue is whether or not these cells at their boundary would give you continuous geometric uh, representation. And they, by nature, they may not, unless you put certain constraints on them. In our case, with these lines that we could, or you rely on your mechanics physics, uh, hopefully, the level set still will hold together to give you the correct answer. So in our case, we use these lines as a set of a parameterization. So you implicit the these line functions in tensor product with coefficients that allow you to define your piece of my function, uh, your level set function within each cell. So this is done in a cell level. This is in three dimensional case, and then. Uh, you can enforce continuity between cells at their boundary by imposing conditions on the coefficients of your B spline functions over two cells at the uh, interface. So C0 continuity, C1, even up to uh, coverage continuity. So this could be easily implemented and enforced. So all you need to do is keep track of them. And um, if you don't impose them, you could also just rely on your sensitivity. Uh, hopefully, your optimization algorithm will keep all these continuity together, which I will show you an example later. And uh, uh, of course, that depending on your needs, I will show you in the end that continuity actually imposes certain geometric constraints, and that could change the results slightly in the case of a stress optimization quite a bit. I will show you that later. And just flash through some of these examples. One of the key benefit of this is that now you could have cellular materials or cellular structures defined in terms of cells to optimize your structure at the cellular levels. Uh, you, know, you could also do the cell di uh, uh, division if you want to increase the accuracy or increase the granularity. 
So you will be able to further define or refine your cells to a smaller cells, which will give you better uh, granularity. And overall with these spline functions, as a field function, you could also impose global property distributions. For example, stiffness distributions in the interior of a bone structure as we have already learned in some other uh, people's research work. Uh, one of the benefit, which I should mention very, very briefly, is that with these my representations, and you can easily convert a data into a model. In other words, if you have a data cloud or set of the density representations, then you can easily build a uh, level set model that's called a model reconstruction. So that's a very straightforward. And therefore, you can take CT scan or other measurement data to start your design and optimization process. And this is what we call fast B spline interpolation. It does not require uh, any solution of a set of linear equations, but rather it's a convolution process, just comes out of the cubic B spline properties. And one example. Uh, which I'll show you here is from N topology that says that it can take a, a same type of topology optimization results, convert it into an implicit model, and refine that model, smooth that model, and then to carry on to do other type of analysis such as fine element. And our B spline model or CLIPS model can do what is in the middle. I don't know exactly what N topology has done, but that's just uh, uh, one of the things that you typically need to do um, with the cellular B spline could do that. Other than that, everything else is pretty much similar. Uh, the sensitivity of that is essentially similar, except that you would just need to do this on each cell, and then you summon them up to, uh, to do a global computation. In terms of the final element, of course, you have to do a global final element computation. There is no a way to get away from that. And I also mentioned that uh, uh, integrals in terms of the QVC spline could be implemented as convolutions, which is much faster than other type of uh, uh, processes. I will not get into the details. Now, let me just show you some examples that we have done. And here is a very straightforward the structural optimization of the mean compliance on the left is a global level set solution on the right is a cellular level set solution without uh, identical uh, because of the objective function constraint everything same so your cellular level set model does not really give you any difference unless you add more so here another example a sort of a bridge type with a plate in the middle as a result is something that we all know quite well so only when we get to the situations where we want to do cellular so we have a structure, but structure consists of set of cells and we want to optimize these cells. They could be identical or they could be periodical or they could be different in any way that you would like to control them. And here we impose C0 continuity, geometry would be continuous. And then you could do periodical, you could do the layered cellular structure, cellular materials, or if you don't have any control over the cells, and then will become a global structure optimization. For example, mean compliance, we already know that the best mean compliance solution is a very much a solid structure. And uh, here's another example that is the plate under central loading, but we require the material to be distributed over entire plate in terms of the cells, and cells are periodical, within the plane, but vertically in the two and a half D, half D dimension, it could be changed. Therefore, it is optimized. We have three layers of the cells and the cells across the layer are different and optimized in terms of your uh, objective function. In this case, again, the mean compliance. In addition to these splines, you might be able to use other type of basis functions for parameterization. So uh, uh, RBFs is one of the very uh, common type. And uh, uh, we also implemented that. For this, 
it's very difficult to impose geometric continuity conditions on the coefficients. So basically, we will not do any of that. And then we implemented this with a full parallel level set plus a parallel fine element uh, uh, process. So we want to do high uh, resolution or high definition computations with a relatively large number of uh, elements as well as cells. So again, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples where the number of the cells as well as the number of elements increases in different cases, we get up to about 7 million cells. And I will show you that as the cell numbers or element number increases, your optimal solutions would be different. And here we see the same plate comes into the picture once we have about 7 million uh, cells. So, so this is some phenomena uh, that, that the, the older Denmark group has fully uh, reviewed. And we understand that the optimal solution also depends on uh, your fine element uh, 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 granularity. Uh, we did another example uh, that is uh, the plate uh, with central loading. And uh, uh, you find that the plate is pretty much uh, uh, optimized with top and uh, bottom layer of the material, but in the middle, there are a number of uh, stiffeners. And this is not as big as uh, Professor Sigmund's aircraft mean, uh, wing example, but still we were very delighted to see similar stiffener structures between uh, two plates. And uh, you can do this for uh, other type of uh, structures, which we have done. And very recent pieces on um, stress minimization. So here we have the half uh, a quarter circular beam uh, subject to a loading. And then we implemented this with cellular level setting. In other words, we require, uh, we have to have cells distributed and uh, these cells could be optimized individually or in terms of some set of organizations, which I uh, will show you actually here. So this is a case where uh, same set of cells be used, but the continuity conditions are imposed differently. As you can see that when we impose C2 continuity, the resulting stress level, well, Mises stress is actually higher. So this says that these continuity conditions are actually geometric conditions you impose on. So when you impose more conditions, results could be better, could be worse. And then this is where we change the cell types from the global on the very left to highly periodical, totally periodical to the right. And in the middle is circumferential periodical or radial periodic. So these are just the user specification and obviously you will get different results. At full solid structure in this case still works the best in terms of the stresses. But if you do need cells, you have the cellular requirements and then this would be a way to do it. So in other words, cellular structures are much more complex, much more difficult and gives you flexibility in terms of the functional specifications, but they're not necessarily the best structure performance in comparison with a totally solid structure. So that's pretty much all I have. I wanted to go through rather quick so that we will not drag on for too long. And these are some of my uh, former and current students. And uh, one of uh, which, uh, which uh, uh, Professor Puilio was the, uh, a visiting scholar with me for about a year. So with that, I'll thank you very much and I'll conclude my talk. Thank you, Michael. Perfect timing. So we have uh, four to five minutes to discuss what uh, Michael presents. But any question, please feel free to, uh, to ask. I can volunteer. Yeah, please, for, yeah. uh, thanks for a nice talk, Michael. Uh, I was wondering about this continuity that you said that higher continuity requirement uh, gave more stress. I would expect that if you had C0 continuity, you could have kinks and that would give stress concentrations, but not if you have higher. So can you explain that somehow or give me in the it's information a, for that? It's a very interesting question. 
this is one. Uh, so that's three cases with C0 continuity, C1, and C2. C2 basically gives you curvature continuity, but the resulting mormesis and stress is still the highest. Now, from what we understand is that when we use C0 continuity, even though we compute the stresses, but some of the stress concentrations were not captured. So essentially, there could be stress concentrations at the lower level of continuities, but our final element just was not able to reveal that. That's how- oh, So you, did, you didn't it. extract a, a body fitted mesh. It's still on the, it's still on the regular or right. jagged edges. And That's also what? for C2 continuity, it only deals with continuity across the cells. Mm. And between inside each cell, it doesn't really add any conditions anymore. So it just becomes a slightly considered, slightly more geometric constraints. Does not really help you out on the stresses. Uh, that's my guess. So to fully understand this, uh, honestly, I really have not looked very carefully. Uh, but this is again the highest uh, of of stress. So again, it's very local. So you, you need to have a conclusive assertion, we need to be very careful. But overall, this continuity condition does affect your solution. So that's what I can say. Uh, Michael, this, this is really interesting question. Uh, I mean, from a topological perspective, the difference is quite actually small if you look at these three uh, different solutions. That's true. That's the trouble with uh, localized stresses. Yeah, it's basically it still rapidly with a small change in geometric details. And so that's something that we key. have been struggling all over the years in our community. Mm. How to put a good handle on stresses, it's tough. You, you still use the PLOMO function as an objective? Uh, we but, use the aggregation. So there's, it's definitely aggregation, stiffness aggregation. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, was right. a, looking at this picture, I would say in C0, on the bottom left, there's a very high stress concentration. It looks red. So, yeah, a yeah. over here. so the, the actual maximum stress might be much higher than the P norm. So it would yeah. be interesting to check the, the actual maximum value of the stress to see whether they have some pattern or some trend. Right. So uh, definitely the highest level of stress is at the bottom layer on the left corner here, yeah. bottom left. And uh, whether or not our calculation is accurate enough or, uh, and also this is where the load F is applied. So that, that's where you're going to have high stress anyway. So, <laughs> so that's, that's always the difficulty. And in most cases, you might just block it out and say that, uh, that was the point or that area we, we should not really, really get into it. We know it's going to be high, a little bit higher or a little bit lower, probably something we, we need to consider from another, another perspective. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, we, we can still come back to have fun, some sort of a panel discussion or panel questioning later. So probably let's move to our next speaker. All right, our second speaker is going to be Professor Shika Chen from Stony Brook University. Uh, can you just uh, bring your PowerPoint? Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Can you share screen again? Can you hear me? We can hear you, but can you just okay, share yeah. your screen? Yeah, it's yeah. coming the way. Yeah, thank you. Now we okay. can see your screen. 
Yeah. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, and I would like to uh, share with you some of our recent research in the topology optimization on the manifold. So using the so-called extended never set approach and the conformal geometry theory. Uh, this is a collaborative work with my colleague, Professor uh, David Gu at Stonebrook University, who is a mathematician and computer scientist. So uh, our motivation for doing topology optimization on surface was on uh, how to apply topology optimization in designing the uh, flexible electronics. So as you see uh, the example here, uh, you may see those kind of uh, flexible electronics are usually printed on the surface uh, using the uh, photoisography or 3D printing technology. So when we first uh, uh, confronted with this problem, we want to uh, using the, the, the never set approach, uh, but we later realized um, we struggling for a long time. We realized it's not that easy because the surface have curvature. So when the surface uh, can be flattened to a plane structure, which we call uh, without stretching, which we call it undevelopable surface. A developable surface, uh, we can still do it. But when it's, when it's an undevelopable surface, that means we cannot flatten the surface directly without stretching it. In that case, it's very hard to apply the never set approach directly. And later when we look around in our life, we found this phenomenon exists everywhere. For example, in the architecture design, the structure not need to be uh, provide the node carrying capability, but also need to provide, satisfy some other requirement. For example, the aesthetic requirement. And even in the aircraft structure design, the exterior surface of the, of the uh, aircraft is determined by, this, by the fluid dynamics requirement and the internal conformal ribs has to be conformed to the surface and providing the node capability, node carrying capability. So the phenomenon is everywhere, but how to extend the level set approach from the Euclidean space uh, to the, to the uh, Riemann manifold or to the services, that's our challenge. Because Michael is here, he has already given a very wonderful explanation to, to never set approach. So without further ado, I will directly point out the limitations. So uh, the level set method, as you see here, it can, it's basically defined in the Euclidean space. You can do 2D design or 3D design. Uh, let me see. Uh, either way, anyway. You can do 2D design or 3D design uh, within the never set framework, but the computational domain has to be a flat, flat domain, either in 2D or 3D. But the challenge is how to do it in a curved surface. That's the challenge. And we are not the first uh, group of people to doing this. Actually, in the field of mathematics, people have already uh, done such kind of research using different approaches. Uh, some people using the so-called the direct approach, which discretize the manifold with triangularized uh, with with triangularized mesh, and directly approximate uh, the differential operators in those uh, in those mesh. The the problem is. You can only do it within a very tiny, small area because the manifold uh, locally is Euclidean, but globally it cannot be uh, approximated using one reference frame. But you have to introduce uh, a field of reference frames to describe the whole surface. Uh, the other groups also using the explicit embedding method or, in, in, uh, or implicit embedding method. In this method, the basic, basically they increase the dimension of the problem. So the computational cost is a challenge. And now what we fo follow is a new approach called uh, conformal geometry theory. This was pioneered by Professor Xin Tung Yao at Harvard University. And my colleague, uh, Professor David Gu spent all his life in developing uh, this approach. The key idea is dimension reduction. So we can convert a 2D surface embedded in R3 into a 2D plane. And then all the computation is done in the 2D plane. So the computational cost is greatly reduced because we reduced problem from 3D to 2D and without losing any accuracy. So I will explain the details later. So uh, the next question is what is the conformal geometry theory? So I want to use one example to illustrate the key idea. So for example, we have a human face, as you see here, this is a typical uh, manifold. 
And then you see we have two pla uh, planar ch patterns, a chessboard pattern and a circular pattern. So we want to map those patterns from the 2D plane into the uh, 2D surface in R3. So the, my question is, how many mappings can we have? So the answer is there are infinite number of mappings, the infinite kind of possibilities. But as you see here, this mapping is very special. It's very obvious, as you can see, the rectangle after you do the mapping um, is still a rectangle on the surface. And the circle after you do the mapping is still a circle on the surface. So that means something is invariant during the mapping process. So mathematicians are always interested in something that is invariant. So uh, the physical quantity that is invariant here is the angle. The angle is well preserved in the, in the mapping process. And this mapping is a so-called conformal mapping. So without further ado, I just try to uh, briefly introduce, illustrate what is the conformal mapping and what is the challenge it can bring to us. So the challenge is here for our application. The challenge is we can map not only the geometry from the plane to the surface or vice versa. We can also map the physical geometrical quantity or even the physical quantity like the tensor from a plane to the manifold or back, back force. And in this way, we can re-derive the equivalent form of the hamilton jacobi equation. We can map it from plane to the surface or from surface to the flame. But the advantage by doing this is that, so we can reuse all the Navasata methods people have developed so far. And then we can extend the Navasata approach from the Euclidean space to the manifold. That's the key idea. And people may ask, why are you using the conformal mapping without using any other mapping? The answer is only with conformal mapping, we can have the simplest form of the partial differential equation. So that's the key idea. If you're using other kind of form, the partial differential equation will have an extremely complicated form, which make it computationally formidable. So without overdue, I just show you, this is the, this is the classical uh, hamilton jacobi equation in Euclidean space. So we can derive its manifold form and using conformal mapping, so we can re-derive the hamilton jacobi equation in, from the manifold form, uh, transform it into, the, into its Euclidean form. So the additional term we introduced is the e to the minus lambda. This lambda has a physical meaning. It's called the volume ratio, okay? Volume vector is essentially, uh, it's a metric measure the, measure the volume change because you have to stretch uh, a, a surface to make it flatten. Thus physically, the physical meaning for lambda is the volume change for the, for the material. And it, once we have this, uh, the, the, the extended Navasat equation, and then we can do the boundary evolution problem in the, 2D, in the 2D domain. And the solution is equivalent to the original problem. So that's, that's the key idea. So the first application, this is our early application, is to design the node carrying structure. So here is, uh, here is a vase. So uh, I see Jun has a wonderful example in the web page. So we, we, have a, we do a similar design here. So it is under a pressure in the vertical direction well, with a twisting force. And then the final design. So as you see here, the left one show you the boundary evolution on the surface and the right one show you the boundary evolution on the, on the plane. So with this method, one additional advantage is that because you have the clear boundary and never said is, uh, is a geometric model. So all the geometric information are embedded there, not only the boundary location, but the normal vector uh, curvature. So we can convert anything from the plane to the, to the boundary of, of, of back force. And then we can print it, print the design to get what you see is what you get. The second example uh, I want to show here is, is a chair, is a chair. So this is a so-called a very typical undevelopable surface. That means you cannot flatten the surface of the chair uh, without stretching it. The loading condition is shown here. Um, and then uh, this figure show you the boundary evolution of this uh, optimization process. So this is the final design. So this is a, our early work is still the node carrying process. We also later we extend this work to multi-material design and also to the actuator design and origami design, as uh, we will show you later. So for multi-material design, there are basically two kinds of models. The first model was pro pro proposed by Professor Michael Wang, who is here. Uh, 
using the so-called color level set. And here we're using a reconcile level set approach. We borrowed from the uh, CFD people. People use it to, to model the multiphase flow, the motion of the multiphase flow using the so-called MBO operator. So uh, the key idea is by introducing the MBO operator, uh, we can well handle the overlapped area in the different material phases. So it can automatically find the central curve of the overlapped area. That's the key idea. And the advantage is that we can use a single level set function to represent a single material, and we can maintain the sign distance property for each single phase. That's what we want. So the second example is the multi-material uh, design. We have a relatively soft material and a relatively hard material. The soft material is the blue material, as you show here, as you see here, and the hard material is the is the red material. The boundary condition and uh, uh, is show is the same as the previous example, and this is the final design. So uh, this is where we start from. We try to start from still from the node carrying. Uh, structures and later we will gradually move to the uh, flexible electronics design and uh, even the actuator and origami design. Uh, we also did some experiments uh, thanks to, to Oni and uh, Professor Kurt Maut. So we, when I first presented this result at the topology optimization uh, round table, Professor uh, Sigma and Professor Maut give me some good suggestion. So later we do some comparison between the conformal design structure and also the conformal native structure and the reference structure, which has a uniform cyclic. So here we do uh, um, using a, a semi-cylindrical structure to make it simple. The Gaussian curvature is zero, Gaussian curvature is zero. And then we do a uniaxial compression test and we compare just the, the mean compliance of the three design. So as you see here, uh, the conformal structure, the conformal rib structure, will have the highest stiffness. And the reference structure with uniform cyclics has the lowest stiffness. And the conformal native structure is something between there. The performance is between there. So that means with the same, the same weight or the same volume, the three design, the conformal rib structure is a continuous structure, has the best performance. Or with the same performance requirements, we can have we can get the nicest design in the other way, if you're using the uh, conformal topology optimization. So that's the uh, the conclusion we can make here. Our recent research uh, was done. We extended this work to the uh, flexible electronics design. And one of the applications is in designing the soft robot. Uh, so this is a collaborative work with Professor Xuan He Zhao at MIT. So the key idea is how to combine the conformal topology optimization with the uh, soft active material, with the soft material, uh, active material. The soft active material we use here is the so-called ferromagnetic material. So basically, uh, is a, you can consider this is a matrix material embedded with uh, small magnetic particles. So when we apply an external magnetic field, the magnetization of the, of the particles will be well aligned and memorized. So when we apply a boundary, uh, when we apply another uh, mag magnetic field in the in, in the working scenario, in this case, it can deform deform the material due to the different angle between the magnetization and the uh, external magnetic field, magnetic field. So the problem setting is like in this way. We basically, we try to optimize both the node carrying capability, which means we minimize the mean compliance of the structure. And, and meanwhile, we want to optimize uh, the kinematic, uh, kinematic performance. So this is similar to the uh, compliant mechanism design as we did in conventional topology optimization. So the governing equation is here. So here we need to solve the Maxwell equation to calculate the B and H and the, with getting that, we can further calculate the magnetic force, which is a body force applied to the to the structure. So it's a node is a design dependent problem. It's a design dependent problem. Uh, for simplicity, we consider only the one way coupling. That means we think the magnetic force will have an impact on mechanical force, but the mechanical def deformation will has no impact on the magnetic field. So here is one example where we try to design a flytrap plant 
So you can see this is a flower you may see in the in our daily life. It can capture the the, the insects. So we, due to the similar finger of the flower with um, uh, particles, and then the, the left column show you here at the bottom show you the topology optimization uh, on the 2D plane. And the right one shows you the corresponding boundary evolution on the surface. And this is the final design. This is the final design. So the left one shows you the soft robots without, without the external magnetic field. And the right one is the, the one under the uh, working scenario. So we are now working uh, with Professor Yong Chen at the University of Southern California. We try to use the so-called 4D printing to print the prototype. And hopefully next time I can show you the uh, the printed prototype. And one of the other, uh, the other recent application we try to uh, extend the conformal topology optimization to is the, is the origami design. And to be specific, it's compliant origami uh, design. The conventional origami uh, is initially uh, referred as a paper folding. So you can fold a flat paper and to make it uh, into the complex 3D structures. And the early work in this area uh, is basically people apply the geometric constraint to the truss representation uh, structure to, uh, to achieve the so-called origami. To be specific, uh, to be frank, it's more like, uh, like modeling rather than design. And all this kind of work is based on the assumption that the crease are straight. But the recent development in this field, the people were, uh, in, in this field, they are gradually shifting from the original origami to the so-called compliant origami. That is, the fold is not necessarily the straight, it can be the curve. And the structure can bend or can fold, can be folded utilizing the in-plane deformation. So that is our target. So our challenge is how to find a systematic way to model and optimize such a compliant origami design. Because 2D plane is also a special kind of manifold. So this also applies to um, our conformal topology optimization also applied to this scenario. That's why we, why we try to address this problem. So the first benchmark example is origami gripper design. The boundary condition is shown here. So in the middle of the left edge and the right edge, we have a two, uh, two inward displacement and then the middle is fixed. What we want is we want an out of plane, out of plane displacement. So the problem is form formulated in this way. We have a kinematic requirement. So which is we want the origami structure to satisfy the, uh, the displa displacement requirement. The second one is composed of the characteristic requirement. That is we want the origami to bending or deforming like an origami. So this one is essentially we decompose the energy of the shear structure into three forms. That is uh, the, the stretching energy, the bending energy, and the sharing energy. By manipulating three kinds of energy, we, can, we, can, uh, we, can, we, want to, we want to force the structure to, to deform like an origami. So the third one is, this, is like the parameter design, like the conventional topology optimization with never set approach. So, so this is the first design we achieved. The left one shows you the, the boundary evolution of the origami structure. The right one is the deformed origami structure. Well, you can see how the manifold deform. And we also make a comparison with our design and the design from Professor Nari Horace Group at the Brian Young University. And they achieved this using the ad hoc approach. So it's quite similar to that design. And we also uh, start from different initial designs. We categorize the, our design into three groups. The first group is we only, there's only one fold because in origami design, there are two kinds of fold, either folding up or folding down, or mounting fold or a value fold. In the second group, we have basically two kinds of fold. The blue fold is the mounting fold. The, uh, the, the, red, the red fold is the value fold. So the folding direction is different, that means so the third one is we have two kinds of folds, but the Lambo is different. So very interesting. We get the final design look quite similar. The converge to the similar, uh, similar 
similar uh, optimized design. And we also do uh, validation. Uh, so this kind of validation is easy to implement. And this kind of structure does deform as we, as we expected. But I have to point it out, the organic design, the problem is much more challenging than we expected. So we are still in the learning curve. So if you have any suggestion or comments, uh, please feel free to, to let me know. So let me quickly wrap up what we have done. So we proposed a framework to extend it conventional navset based topology optimization from Euclidean space to Riemann manifold, where well, the surface uh, is no longer flat, but is curved. So the proposed method is general. It can be applied to uh, surfaces with arbitrary topologies and it can be easily transformed to solve other topology optimization problem. Uh, another great advantage is that it's compatible. So it's compatible to conventional Navaset framework and also the finite element approaches. So the last advantage is, is, is efficient because we reduce the dimension. So the computational cost is much lower compared with the dimension increasing approach. Uh, our future work, including the uh, like flexible electronics design and design for uh, 4D printing. Hopefully next time I can show you with more uh, results. This is the related uh, work, uh, related publications to the presented work. And then I would like to thank my students and uh, collaborators, uh, including Professor Wang, who is also here. And also uh, the grants and the support from NSF, Ford, Stratasys, and SUNY system are acknowledged, acknowledged here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Guy. Uh, any questions? Oh, this is your university uh, overview. Um, yeah. Questions. That's beautiful. Thank you for your interesting talk. Any questions, please? So I, Shika, I got I got a question. You talked yes, about please. the surface curvature okay. actually. Okay. The surface curvature okay. will significantly affect the the final results. I mean, affect the materials distribution. So currently, you just design the structure or materials distribution in the given sort of a surface curvature. Did you consider actually combine them? I mean, just the simultaneously optimize the curvature and the materials distribution? That's a very good question. So that means you increase the dimension of the design space. We, uh, that's yeah. the future direction we are, we are moving toward. So you can optimize the manifold simultaneously with the material distribution on the manifold. Mm -hmm. My answer is yes, yeah, but we are not there. Yeah, all right, thank you. Yeah. Shugo, you got a question? Yeah, go okay. ahead, please. I think this is a very interesting work. Uh, my question is that uh, in you, all your uh, examples, you use a single man, single patch to describe the geometry of the surface. Uh, can you can you uh, uh, do, can you use your method to solve the problems that involve multiple patches? What, what do you mean by patch? Excuse me. <laughs> Could you okay. elaborate a little bit more? No, no, you, you, you have a plenary uh, a patch and then you establish a transformation between this plenary patch and the real surface, right? You have a transformation, you are yep. conformal mapping. Yes. But this mapping is established, is established uh, as establishing a transformation between a single patch and the surface. Uh, actually, it's a global parameterization. Global. It's, it's okay. global parameterization. The whole surface is, is, is mapped to the plane. It's not a, just yes, a single but, patch. Yes, I, I think you can establish the transformation. My question is that uh, can you always use a single patch to establish this global parameterization? Uh, I didn't fully understand, but we can, we can discuss offline, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question? So thank you for a very please, nice presentation. Please, yeah. Very interesting. So maybe because I'm not a mathematician, my first question might be stupid. So when you take a 3D 
struck a surface and put it down in 2D and you solve a shell problem, as I understand you're doing, you are still solving for all the shell degrees of freedom that we usually solve for, correct? Or do you also reduce the dimensionality of the mechanic, mechanical problem? No, no, uh, that's a good, fair question. So we only, we, we, we do finite element analysis still in the, in the 3D. Okay, good. We yes, do the boundary was... evolution in the 2D. Yes. Okay. Then, then I I feel a little bit more. Like actually, a... actually, you raise a very good question. That's what we are working on. We try um, the three D elastic problem is the uh, elliptic PDE. So that's what we we have been struggling to convert also convert that PDE into the plane. Okay. Yeah, I'm all ears. That's a very good. That's a very good question. Yeah. So that's that's a very that's another discussion. But I have one more question because it kind of seems a bit like magic to me, like much of math does. Could you take, let's say, an entire aircraft and fold that out into the plane? I mean, so a curve that is closed on several uh, instances. Does, does does that question make sense? I mean, you had the vast that you could open up, and you had other geometries which could. You could kind of envision how you would fold it onto a plane, but what if if you took like a bus or an aircraft? Could you do something the same with this? So mathematically, uh, the surface with arbitrary topology can be mapped into three forms. Okay. Uh, simple answer is yes, but it's not easy. Sometimes I see I'm not a mathematician, but they they just give me the conclusion. I also raise this question to them. The simple answer is yes. Yeah. Okay. Any surface. Yes. Do that. So I have one more question, if I may. Um, so, yes, please. So, yes. So is this, so again, this is actually about the mapping and I know you just said you are not a mathematician, but is this something you have to compute? Do you have to solve some nonlinear system to get the mapping or is it, is it fixed somehow? Yeah, good question. So uh, actually the additional cost that we have to solve here is we, uh, we need to, Solve the so-called Yamabe equation. It's not free. Let me let me show you here. Did you see see my screen? Well, I maybe it's just me. I only see black. No, you need share screen. So uh, yeah. this yes. equation, this equation, as you see, uh, this equation. Mm -hmm. This equation is the is the how. The cost that we need to pay to calculate the to calculate the conformal mapping. So it's done by Professor uh, Hamilton at the University of Columbia. Actually, this method uh, is called a Ricci flow. So uh, it's used in in the proof of the Pangolin's conjecture. So it's not easy. Actually, this one is essentially how they they try to evolve the tensor field. So it's more challenging than evolve the Navier function. So, so in, in some sense, the hardest problem is actually to find the mapping. Once you have that, yeah, it's good to go. Yes. Okay. Well, th thank you very much. May I ask uh, one question, follow up with the nails question, if you, if you have time? Uh, yes, please. Okay. So thank you very much. Very interesting, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. In the here, when you are mapping from a 3D to 2D, it is the, just a geometrical evolution. But you said even you are thinking for a physical mapping. So for example, goes from a 3D to 2D, if I understand in response to the names. So um, my question is in some of the problem, specifically nonlinear problem like damage or crack, if you go from uh, 3D to 2D and 1D, you know that the physics change totally. And sometimes some of the rule is, uh, physical rules that we have actually is changing. Do you think it is possible, for example, to look at the damage and crack evolu evolution? Actually, Design for this, uh, for 2D, 3D, go to the 2D? Uh, you, you raise a very, very good question. Um, actually, people in Russian, they, they, they use conformal mapping in duty case for the crack problem. But for 3D problem, that's the direction, as I said, we are working, working in, but we are, we are not there yet. This problem, the more we learn, the more we find we do not know this, this, this kind of stuff. Okay, We're still in the learning curve, but, but you, the question you raised is definitely very, very good question.
the only literature I find is, I, I don't know why, why we're only the researchers in, 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 in cell field union, the, they, they, they study this kind of method for the 2D crack propagation. But in, in United States, it's not a, it's not a major stream in the, in the research area. So uh, hopefully I can share with you more information as, we, as, as our research moves on, yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we probably got to stop here and uh, we can actually continue to discuss um, uh, probably offline or just uh, uh, after our presentation. All right, so let's move to our next speaker, Professor Shuko from Darling University of Technology. Yeah, please load up your PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, can you uh, see my screen? Okay. Yes, we can see that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers uh, to give me the opportunity to present uh, one piece of our research group here. Uh, today, the topic of my presentation is optimal design of shell graded infill structures by the so-called uh, the MMC and the MMA approach. Uh, I'm Xu Guo from Dalian University of Technology. <clears throat> so this is the outline of my presentation. So first, I want to introduce the motiv uh, motivations of, of, of the present work. So we may know the graded structures usually have a better performance than the, uh, some, the, solid, uh, the, the, the solid structures and the periodic structures. And here are some, uh, are some examples in the nature. So some the boon, the bamboos has has the, uh, the, the the unit the cell which is uh, graded distributed in the in the space. Uh, so this kind of structure uh, has some exceptional uh, mechanical or some multi physics uh, performances when they are subjected to the external uh, stimulation. Stimulation. So uh, recently there is a hot topic for design the structures with, with graded microstructures. So uh, as we know, with the faster development of the 3D printing, so we now has the technology to have the very powerful uh, tools to, to produce the structures with graded microstructures. So uh, in this slide, I summarize some recent works on this topic, for example, uh, Professor Wu uh, presented a very uh, beautiful formulation to design a shell coated structures with non-uniform which can be made by uh, added additive manufacturing. So for this kind of for this, this kind of structure, there is a, a, a coated uh, coated shell structure, and there are some also some infill materials, which is a, a some a, seems like a lattice structure. The Professor Wang also presented some a very interesting work to uh, design the, the macro and the micro structures uh, simultaneously, and the micro structure is distributed in a graded way. Professor uh, Sigman also has uh, some recent work on homogenization based topology optimization, uh, which can achieve very high resolution and the manufacturable uh, micro structures. They use, they, own, they use some the projection technique and, the, and, and some online Yeah, we cannot hear you, Xu. It seems to have some internet problem. Uh, then try to contact him uh, by WeChat. Uh, you see. Yeah, maybe he uh, stepped out and no connect again. Yeah, lost again. So uh, 
Should we wait or just uh, go ahead to bring our next speaker? Maybe let's just wait a couple of seconds, a half, half a minute, then we see whether yeah. I can. Uh, It took him a while to reconnect before, so maybe it's better to take the next speaker and then return to Shu if he managed yeah. to log in later on. Yeah, probably we jump to our next speaker and uh, wait for Shu to come back. Yeah. So, all right, uh, everyone, we move to our fourth speaker, Professor Xiaodong Huang from Swimbo University of Technology. So don't please go ahead to bring your PowerPoint. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor Ni. Uh, okay, uh, I share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Professor Ni. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, it's my great honor to share our recent research here. My name is Xiaodong Huang from Swinburne University of Technology, uh, Melbourne, Australia. <clears throat> my presentation includes four parts, research motivation, topology optimization algorithm, numerical examples, and the concluding remarks. <clears throat> Uh, in real applications, there are many design problems for acoustic mechanical structures and devices. Topology optimization of acoustic mechanical structures can trace back to 2007 using density method. Some researchers have also investigated this problem using the level set method, BSO, and so on. The recent SMO, pa SMO paper did a comparative review on topology optimization of acoustic mechanical structures using various topology optimization algorithms. <clears throat> One benchmark problem is on, on the design of structure for sound insulation. The sound wave incident from the left-hand boundary and propagates through the middle structure to the right-hand domain. The question is how to design the structure with a given volume fraction so that the sound pressure in the shared area becomes minimal. minimal. Consider the propagation of mechanical wave behaves differently in acoustic media and solid media. There are two analysis techniques to capture acoustic and structure coupling. One is a mixed UP formulation, another is a segregate formulation. The segregated formulation is the geometry of structure. The mixed UP formulation is more suitable for topology optimization and the fixed mesh. In the review paper, the benchmark problem was solved by the level set method and the density method. For level set, optimized starts, optimization starts from an initial gas design with predefined holes Optimized topology was achieved through a boundary evolution. The final objective value is 68.7 Newton. When the problem was solved by density method using the RAP model, it results in a different topology. Optimized objective value is only 48.9 Newton. However, when the extract density based design was reanalyzed by segregate formulation, objective value becomes 34.9 Newton. <clears throat> There's a larger dis discrepancy between the UP formulation and the segregate formulation for optimized design. 
Uh, this research aims to achieve consistent objective value between mixed UP formulation during optimization and segregate formulation for extract, ex extract design. We, pro we propose an uh, element-based topology optimization using ASAS material model. The, the bulk models, shear models, and the density of each element are nearly interpolated. Here, xi equal zero means element is composed of, composed of acoustic media. xi equals one for solid media. The potential advantage of use SS material model is to achieve consistency of objective value in the mixed UP formulation and segregate formulation. Additionally, due to the constant ratio between modulus and density, there is no artificial vibration modes during optimization. The topology optimization problem can be mathematically expressed by a minimization of an objective function subject to a series of constraints. The objective function could be sound pressure, uh, structure vibration, or transmission loss. One constraint is on volume fraction. Another one is on the design variables. This is similar to Y0 constraint of design variables except that xi for boundary elements could be uh, between zero and one. The most critical problem in topology optimization is on how to deal with y zero constraint of design variables. <clears throat> to solve the problem, uh, y zero uh, design variables are relaxed as continuous. The objective function is modified by introducing Lagrange multiplies for all constraints. To consider originally Y0 constraints of design variables in the problem, G includes up, up bound constraint, constraint, lower bound constraint, and one additional constraint called floating projection constraint. The floating projection constraint work together with up and lower bounds simulates the original Y0 constraints. These constraints were strictly enforced in the optimization algorithm. This flow chart shows the update scheme of design variables. The design variables are firstly uh, up, updated according to optimality criteria. They enforce up and lower bounds and field schemes. Next, the floating projects projection constraint is applied. This constra constraint defined by a half side function push design variables from inside towards zero or one. <clears throat> Finally, check if volume constraint is satisfied. If not, we can update Lagrange multiply and loop again. This volume constraint can be replaced by other constraints such as sound pressure constraint or multiple constraint. In the floating projection constraint, beta controls the strictness of Y0 constraint. Beta can start from a small positive value, which means low pushing of design variable at the beginning of optimization. Once solution is converged, uh, <clears throat> we increase beta with data beta, which means a more strict Y0 constraint is applied. Once solution is converged uh, for a given beta, we obtain an uh, element-based design expressed by xi. Next, we extract a tentative smooth design from element-based design through graphic processing. Meanwhile, the pro a smooth design projects back to the background mesh for the volume fraction of each element, vi. Although we can ensure that summation of vi equal to the summation of xi, we still need to check the difference between xi and vi. The difference can be made by the mean square error. We may meanwhile check the difference in objective and constraint values. This needs one additional FE analysis based on vi. Sorry.
if this criteria cannot be satisfied, we increase beta with data beta to first push design variables towards zero or one. When another converged solution is achieved, we check this criteria again till the acceptable difference is achieved, stop the whole optimization process. Now we test the develop algorithm on benchmark problem. This figure shows the evolution history of objective value, topology, and beta. When beta is close to zero, solution converges to a design with many gray elements. But main topology is formed. With, with the increase of beta, more and more elements are pushed towards zero or one, and topology become clearer and clearer. Objective value continues decree, decreasing as beta increases. It seems that a one zero solution corresponds to a true minimum, even using the linear SS material model. The left fig shows the follow element-based design and smooth design. Optimized topology is similar to the density-based design, but close observation shows a slight difference in the shape of internal hole. Objective value in the UP formulation is 32.16 Newton. Then the smooth design is input to the console and reanalyzed by segregate formulation. Objective value is 32.43 Newton, which is also very close to the objective value using UP formulation in optimization. Even, even in uh, segregate formulation, objective value of current design is still lower uh, than that of extract density-based design. <clears throat> The problem can be changed to a lightweight design against the sound pressure in the shed area below the uh, 40 Newton. Because sound pressure is constrained to a certain value, its accuracy in optimization for UP formulation become, becomes even more important. Optimization starts from a full design, as shown in the, uh, in the fig, J value, uh, for the initial full design is slightly lower than 40 Newton. As total volume decrease, J value increase a little bit to 40 Newton, and then keep as a constant. The final volume fraction of optimized design is around 43%, but its performance is close to the full design. The final smooth design is reanalyzed in console using a segregate formulation. J value is 39.71 Newton, which is very close to its constrained value, 40 Newton. The next example designs a vibration structure inside a mercury. The structure is supported at two colors and harmonic force is applied at bottom leg. The optimization objective is to minimize the vibration aptitude at the bottom leg. This fig shows the evolution history during optimization. When beta is close to zero, uh, <coughs> the convergent solution uh, does not show a clear topology. Objective value achieved uh, is minimum. As beta increase, topology becomes clearer and clearer. Meanwhile, objective value increase. This variation tendency is totally different from that of previous case for sound insulation. The optimized J value for UP formulation is 4.47. The smooth design use segregate formulation is 4.51. <clears throat> These two values are very close. The algorithm can be equally extended to 3D case. For example, the design of 3D sandwich structure for maximization of sound transmission loss. The right picture shows optimized element-based design and smooth design. To show 3D element-based design, we have 
we have to delete all elements with xi less than 0 0.5. The sound transmission loss using UP formulation and segregate formulation are also close. Uh, the conclusion I list here, since this point have, have been discussed, I will not read one by one. I uh, end my presentation here. More details about this research can refer to the published paper in CMIME. Thanks for your attention. <coughs> Thank, Professor Thank you very much, yes. Professor Juan. Uh, questions? Any questions? All right, so Xiaodong, I, I got a question. So in your convergence yeah. curve, for the convergence yeah. curve actually, uh, you can see the objective converge actually uh, in the stepwise. Step you can see that. So it's always for it's sure. just jump from one state, one iteration to another iteration, just jump. Uh, probably due to some sort of a volume change or due to some uh, other Variation. Which one? So, you mean uh, this one? Yeah, this is a lot of very smooth. I mean, uh, for the beta. Oh, because, because the beta is increased uh, with one for each, uh, uh, for each increase. Oh, OK. OK. Beta, for example, uh, change from 0 to 1, 2, 3, is like that. OK, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? From the audience. Yeah, one, yeah. uh, can you go back to the slide where you showed the update of your design variables with the X okay. and okay. the heavy side? Yes. Oh. Oh, oh, this one. This one, right? Yes, this one. So is it correctly understood that, that you update the design variables? And then afterwards, mm. you do a post process. So you sort of threshold them, so you make them sharper. And then you go mm. back again and update. Mm. So, so I would, in my eyes, so, so, uh, so you're not uh, doing the consistent sensitivity analysis. Is that correctly understood? Uh, actually, uh, because these floating pro projections are processed as a constant, is simulate one zero constraint, push the design variable from, yeah. uh, from inside towards zero or one. It's like a constraint. constraint. OK. Uh -huh. it, it forces the uh, design uh, back to uh, yeah, one yeah, zero. I understand design. that, but, but the red box, isn't that sort of where you take your updated design variables and then you push them to zero one? And then yeah. you go back and update design variables again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, actually, uh, for this uh, push, have nothing to do with uh, this constraint. Uh, <coughs> we can show uh, uh, here. Uh, for example, this constraint is changed to uh, change to other value, change to uh, sound pressure. But uh, objective is minimize volume. Yeah. So it's not uh, nothing to do with the volume constraint. Okay. Maybe I will try to read your paper in more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions to Professor Juan? All right, so if no more question directly to uh, Professor Huan, we just contact the uh, Professor Shugo from uh, in China. He, he's currently in a hotel. The hotel got some sort of internet connection problem. So um, probably <laughs> we'll lose him <laughs> to move him to probably in the future sessions. Uh, so now let's have uh, some panel discussion or panel questioning. And uh, everyone feel free to ask uh, uh, questions to our three speakers, Professor Michael Wan, Professor uh, Shukai Chen, and Professor Xiaodong Wan.
we can expand the further discussion in some issues. Yeah, Jim, please go ahead. Uh, yes, I have a question for Sukri. And, uh, and, and this conformal mapping is very interesting. Uh, conformal mapping preserves angle, but it doesn't preserve area. So my question is, uh, when the area is not preserved, do you notice any uh, consequence in the optimized results? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, actually, uh, it does. If you, if you, if you see the, uh, we do have some benchmark example there. Um, but the good thing is that we, uh, the volume is, we, we define the volume on the surface. So only if those volume is satisfied, volume constraint is satisfied, and then mm -hmm. there should be no problem. But in metamaterial design, when we try to mat, uh, map a metamaterial from a 2D domain into a 3D surface, you know, the metamaterial, it will be stretched. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, in that case, it does have some performance on the property. That's intuitive. We, we are still learning what is the impact because you are trying to mapping a tensile from a 2D domain to 3D domain. That's the intrinsic difference between the conventional method. So what is the impact on the mapping, mapping on the tensile, like the elastic, uh, uh, elastic tensile mm -hmm. in, in, in our linear elastic problem. That is what we are working on. So I mean, you still measure the volume and all the constraints on the curved domain. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. And for the lattice structure, if you map from the 2D domain to a 3D domain, the, since area is not preserved, it will be enlarged and uh, uh, Actually, for, for conformal mapping, the total mass is preserved. If you, if you consider there is a density and there's a volume, even the volume is, is changing, the density, is, the density is, 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 is decreased. So it's balanced. The total mass is preserved. OK, it's a bit counterintuitive to me. When the, volume, when the bounding box is enlarged, uh, yeah, I, I will read later. If you consider there's an additional dimension, if there is a thickness, image, the thickness is de decreased and then the, the, the area increased, but the total mass is the same. Okay. Yeah, it does have impact. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience in particular? All right, Michael, I got a question to you. So in your SMO paper, you just present a stress-based uh, sort of a cellular uh, design. Why do you use actually XFAN? What's the benefit? Uh, you need to turn on your, uh, unmute your, so we cannot hear you. Can yeah. you rephrase your question? I, I didn't quite get it. So in your, Stress-based design, you actually use XFAN, extended finite element methods. Oh. Uh, what's the benefits? Uh, not really. It's just something that convenient. It's something that we know that we can get it down. We know we can get the accuracy reasonably good enough. So there's really no, no other, other big reason. Fine element, it's a it's fine element, um, as long as it works out well. But when you go to more granular team, you get more um, higher resolutions. And then, of course, things need to be more careful. All right, thank you. Any other questions? May I ask a question from Michael? So, sure. yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much, Michael, for your presentation. When uh, for this stress, uh, stress with the topology optimization, so you are using XFEM, are you actually taking care of the mapping from uh, in the, during the integration from your um, element that caught by the interface, you're mapping to uh, uh, from a physical domain to an integration domain. So when you are doing this, do you have any particular um, actually uh, formulation to take care of this mapping because of the mapping from your physical domain to your integration domain? So in XM, uh, what do you do 
means you need to look at the partially cut element and then you uh, in the integration you use an enrichment function uh, by extending your nodes outside of the material domain. So that's the tricky part of the XM where for partially cut element, for those nodes which are outside the material domain, you still define their displacement and then you do an integration. Okay. But of course, in the computation of uh, uh, displacement string, you don't use those. So these are the, the little bit needy greedy part of the uh, XM. And you also need to figure out the approximate boundary where you made the cut. So typically we do linear approximation. And then we, once you have that enrichment, then you can throw that into your Gauss quadrature, you do your integration. So instead of doing refinement of your mesh, you change the shape function by enriching it outside your domain, then you can do the Gaussian uh, curvature. So that's, that's what XM is really about. It's just a different, slightly different technique handling that integration. So my question exactly regarding this integration, because in the regular finite element, this Gauss quadrature actually is independent from your design parameter when the geometry is changing. But when we go to XFEM or any kind of the method like XFEM, GFEM or any uh, immersed methods finite element. So then when we go for our, from our physical domain to our um, integration domain, then uh, there, our Gauss quadrature point, they are a fun, actually, they are dependent to our design parameter. By changing the, the geometry, oh. they are changing too. No, that's not how we do it. In the, in the XFAM, we always use a background mesh. So your geometric boundary evolves along on a background geometric mesh. Yes. Where you have those elements which are fully in your material domain, you keep them. Those are fully out, you don't keep them. Those partially cut, that's where you do an enrichment. So in the sense that the number of elements in the final element keeps changing if your geometric boundary goes. But your Gauss quadrature, Gauss quadrature points for each element, you don't change. Okay, offline, I, I will send some paper to you. I will shoot you an email. I will send some paper in this regard. We can uh, it discuss- It could be some newer, newer advancement in XFAM. Uh, our implementation has been old. I have not do any newer XFAM for a long time. That's what I told uh, uh, Professor Lee also. It's just uh, one of the things we think we know how to do it, how to use it, we take it up and put them in there. Uh, there. There ought to be some newer newer development that could make things better. But you can tell that I'm not a, I'm not a, a mechanics person, so I don't pay a lot of attention on all that. Okay. Thank <laughs> I'm you. I'm more geometry, I'm more geometry <laughs> person, yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, any other quick questions? So probably uh, we're gonna stop here. Uh, once again, I would like to thank all speakers, including Xu Guo, who could not actually make it uh, during the interlay problem. And also thanks all the audience actually participating in today's uh, webinar in the Wish everyone can join our future webinar. I think this is a really great opportunity for us to uh, communicate and talk to each other in a regular, regular basis. So thanks for all the organizers provide this platform and opportunity to us. All right, thank you.
Wish everyone a good day. Take care. See you next time. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Thank you okay. Bye bye. Uh, thank just you. a short announcement. Uh, the next yeah, session will please. be a semantic session on large scale and efficient topology optimization. It is scheduled on the 29th of October. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, yeah. thank you everyone.